Shalom and hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, David Parsons, one of the vice presidents and the senior spokesman here at the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, welcoming you to our ICEJ webinar. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we uh, step back to a sort of a, su a summer schedule of once a month, also been doing some feast webinars, but it's uh, the first Thursday of August, 4 p.m. Uh, that means it's time for our monthly uh, webinar now uh, until we go back to a weekly schedule. But we just thank you for joining us. Uh, um, please let us know where you are coming to us from over in the chat section. If you need interpretation, uh, we have French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Thai for those joining us from those countries. But thank you for uh, joining us here on our webinar with the latest uh, topic, hot topic, we'll call it, just how hot is Israel's northern border? And uh, of course, we've been in an extended heat wave. And uh, I think when I came up with that title, it's almost like uh, you're on Johnny Carson, how hot is it? <laughs> and we're not talking so much about the weather, even though it's hot, we're talking about all the tensions on Israel's northern border with Lebanon, Syria, a lot of provocations by Hezbollah along the border over recent weeks, very open uh, public uh, intentional provocations trying to stir trouble with Israel, Israel holding big exercises up there. I know in a lot of uh, Christian circles, Christians who pay attention to Israel, there's all sorts of rumors that Israel's about to go to war with uh, with Iran and, and with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And to help us really get uh, gauge the right temperature, our military weatherman today, our guest is Major Elliot Chadoff. He's been a guest before. He's with the IDF Reserve, also uh, still part of the uh, IDF Home Front Command in the Northern Region, part of Northern Home, uh, Home Front Command. Uh, Major Chadoff has, has spent uh, decades, I think it's 35 years or so, uh, in the IDF, and among his different accomplishments, uh, Elliot, I think you wrote IDF training manuals, how to train soldiers in, I guess, armor, infantry, and what, and a uh, uh, really commendable military career, and still he lives in the North, he knows, uh, has all the right contacts, and I think he's the right person to tell us just how hot is Israel's northern border. That's the sort of lead in. Can you give us uh, your own sort of briefing here? How are things are standing? You know, you had um, you had a, a tank shell fired across the border. You had these two tents placed on the Israeli side. You had someone climbing a, a listening tower of Israel, taking yes. stuff down. What's going on up there? What's okay, happening? It is it is certainly hotter now than it has been recently, um, but I think it's important to understand that question of whether we're at war or going to be at war, we're at war. We have been nominally at war since 1948, but if you wanna talk about you know, the Northern border as it exists today, we've been at war with Hezbollah since they came into existence, which is the early 1980s. Different, different literature gives different dates, but early 80s is good enough for our purposes. Uh, the intensity and the extent of that warfare varies from time to time. We were in uh, direct hot conflict with them all through the decade of the 90s when we were in South Lebanon. Then we withdrew. There was a lower intensity period, but it wasn't quiet. There was shooting across the border. Uh, there were soldiers killed, soldiers' bodies taken, uh, leading up to what we call the Second Lebanon War of 2006, which was extremely an extremely intensive warfare period for about seven about five weeks, excuse me. And then it kind of settled down with occasional blips in activity. And today we're seeing a, a more serious blip, if you will. And does it mean necessarily that we're going to war? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, but the real question is when, and that nobody really has the answer to. Okay, the, the Israel's uh, conflict with Iran, and let's be clear, the war with, or the issue with Hezbollah 
is an issue with Iran. Uh, people mistakenly refer to Hezbollah as a proxy of Iran. Hezbollah is, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Quds Force Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran. In other words, Hezbollah takes its orders directly from the Iranian leadership. So the conflict with Hezbollah is a conflict with Iran. The conflict with Iran is has been escalating. It's again and not it's periodically in the news, but it's happening far more frequently than than the news is reporting it. We're striking Iranian targets in Syria. We're causing quite a bit of damage. They're pushing against us. Uh, they're trying to move their military up to our border with Syria, uh, the Golan border, so they can control both the Lebanese border and the Syrian border that we have. Uh, and this is this is all ongoing. And as I said, periodically you'll see it in the news when one of our airstrikes hits something in the, the Damascus area, so that they, they can get you know video clips of it. Uh, or periodically, the strike is heavy enough and it kills a whole bunch of either Hezbollah and or Iranian soldiers uh, that may, makes, makes it out into the news as well. But I can tell you that those periodic uh, sort of flashes in the news are a very, very minor aspect or a minor part of, of what's going on. So I think really the question is why now? Uh, in other words, and I, I think that's always a fair question because we don't escalate. They do, and everything that we've seen going on is, has been entirely at, at their initiative. And they're not stupid people. They don't act randomly. They don't act irrationally. So it's a fair question, like what's going on today? And for that, I think we need to look at a much broader context. Uh, I think that the best way to begin to understand how broad this context is, is to take a brief, um, example look at what happened prior to the Six-Day War in 1967. And I'm going to do this, it's not going to be a long history lesson, it's just a, a couple of quick points to, to, to illustrate my, my point. Uh, the Six-Day War broke out on June 5th, 1967, but the crisis actually began at the end of April. There was an incident with Syria that escalated over the month of May. And the important point for what I want to say today is that the reason it es escalated is that the Russians, the Soviets, prodded the Egyptians to escalate. The Egyptians escalated willfully, willingly, along with the Soviets, and that ultimately led to the war. And this raises the same question that I asked earlier about what's happening here today. Why then? Because there have been crises all through the early 60s, uh, in, into 65 and into 66, and the Russians never pushed the Egyptians or the Syrians to escalate it to a level that was gonna break out into a war. And the answer, interestingly enough, is that in 1967, the United States of America was fully bogged down in Vietnam for the first time in the Vietnam period. And the Russians correctly assumed that America did not have the ability to fight the war in Vietnam, maintain its full standing force in Europe with NATO, and come to Israel's aid. So Israel was suddenly stripped of a potential ally, and the Russians said, now's the time to make the move. Okay, so just to emphasize the point, America's deep involvement in Vietnam is one of the contributing factors to the Six Day War of 1967, okay? If you get that point, you'll understand that a weak America today, and America's at the weakest point it's been in, in terms of military, relative military power, it's the weakest it's been since 1939. Mm -hmm. We're in a, an international, what I would call perfect storm of an aggressive, out of hand Russia, who sees America as the primary enemy, an increasingly aggressive China that sees America as a primary enemy, an increasingly out of hand aggressive North Korea that sees America as a primary enemy, all of whom are capable of making mischief. And if I were to guess, I would say simultaneously, at least coordinating timetables, if not coordinating forces. The world knows it. Uh, and countries like Iran, and Iran is sort of the, the fourth of the four in that mix, who also sees America as a primary enemy, is now looking to gain as much advantage as they can, knowing that America is not in a position to intervene strongly in the Middle East. That is what is prodding the Iranians now 
to push Hezbollah, to push Hamas, to push Islamic Jihad into escalation. We're seeing it with, with Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Judea and Samaria, hence the recent operation, our recent operation in Jenin to try to, to short circuit that. And how successful that was remains to be seen. There are still terrorist attacks going on. So Hezbollah is all part of that. Now, one other factor, the unrest, unrest is a bad word for the demonstrations in Israel, the internal domestic conflict in Israel gives the impression, and I think it's an incorrect impression, that Israel is weak. And here we need to understand that that impression is built on an already existing impression by dictatorships that democracies are inherently weak. Okay, and here uh, the demonstrations sort of carry that up to a whole different level. And let me explain why. This, this is not coming down on the side of the demonstrators, and there are demonstrators now from both sides and which side, and the whole issue. Leave that for a moment. Israel's in the middle of a domestic conflict, is overstating it, but let's say conflict, with many demonstrations going in now for months. Let's for a moment look at what happens to demonstrations in Iran. The Iranians come out, they shoot, they arrest, they hang, they have their irregular forces, the, the Basij, they use Hezbollah to go out into the streets, beat people up, hospitalize them, kill them. That's the way a dictatorial regime deals with demonstrations against the regime. They look at Israel, where there have been demonstrations going on for months, and if I count demonstrators, in other words, not individuals, but if the same individual shows up two days in a row, I count them as two demonstrators. We've had millions of demonstrators over the, the last six months, not a single fatality, arrests on the level of people blocking traffic, but not mass arrests of demonstrators being rounded up, um, you know, en masse by the police. And countries, leaders like Iran, Iranian leadership, look at that and say, how can you run a country like that? Putin looks at, at this and says, how can you run a country? How is it that the leaders of the opposition are still alive and not falling out of windows? Which is how the Russians do it. So this gives the impression that Israel is in a particularly weak situation at the moment, and that also leads to escalation. There is an element of truth to that, and only an element, because while the government is involved in the legal reform with the demonstrations, with an eye on Iran, because Iran is the primary enemy, Hezbollah is secondary, the government, and in this case, I, I believe is, it's mistaken in its strategy, but I understand what it's doing, is trying to soft pedal its response to Hezbollah to prevent escalation. Excuse me a second. To prevent escalation. I believe that that will ultimately lead to escalation, that it's a mistake. Yeah, but, you've had these open provocations along the border, and Israel right. really, the two tents, they had to beg them, please remove them, and Hezbollah. Exactly. exactly. That's all. And, and, and what I would have done, with all due respect, is I would have made a public announcement, these tents are going to be gone in one half hour. Yeah. The only you it's your choice. <laughs> you want to fold them up and walk away, or do you want us to, to deal with it? And if they were still there 30 minutes later, I would give them the benefit of a 155 millimeter artillery barrage, and that would have been in the end of the tents and the issue, and they would have screamed bloody murder. And it might have escalated, it might not have, but my guess is that it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I wouldn't negotiate with them. I wouldn't give them a, a quid pro quo, you pull back from here, we'll pull back from there. I would say, here we are, this is what we're doing. Um, and if you don't like it, that's too bad. Because it, what it seems like to me is that Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, is now more likely to make the mistake that he made in 2006. And that is to think that he can get away with something, it will either by design or not get out of hand, and we will be forced to retaliate and to respond in large numbers, in large force, as we did in 2006, and have a situation 
where Nasrallah himself, after the war, said, if I had known that had been the Israeli response, I never would have launched, launched the operation in the first place. He said Israel was weak as a spider web. That's right. That was his, his famous just summer, summer, yeah. summer 2000, his speech in, in Minchmel. Exactly. So when our enemies believe that we're like a spider web, that if you go like this, it disappears, that greatly enhances the chance that they will make the mistake and actually believe it. Mm. Yeah. So that's essentially what's going on today. Um, the The provocations are still let's say on a very low measured level, the Iranians certainly don't want Hezbollah to get into a war because they want to hold Hezbollah as their strategic reserve, as their retaliatory reserve, if, when we strike Iran. Hmm. And they don't want to waste them. They'll use them. In other words, we've already made clear that the next war with Hezbollah is going to be the last war with Hezbollah. So if they're going to, if they're going to be wiped out anyway, the Iranians at least want to get their money's worth. Mm -hmm. And a sort of side war now is not their money's worth as far as they're concerned. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Nasrallah got his knuckles wrapped by uh, Tehran, by the Ayatollah, for provoking the war in 2006 and wasting yes. all of these missiles and rockets. Yes, especially since in the end, uh, it didn't have the impact that he wanted it to have. No. Yeah, yeah. Israel has has bought. Uh, you have to say, uh, you know, sixteen, seventeen years of a fairly uh, a fair amount of quiet along the northern border. Of course, there's always right. tensions and all, but uh, Hezbollah has held back ever since. Even when rockets were flying from Gaza, and there was yes. an incentive to get involved from the north, they haven't until uh, this Passover when they allowed Hamas to fire 34 rockets into northern Okay, Israel. but even then, even then, they were very careful to say, we didn't do it, they did it. Yeah. Now, I want to remind you that back in the day, and I'm talking about in the early 90s um, and, and the late 80s coming out of uh, Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, all these organizations wanted to take credit even if they didn't do the operation. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, the, the, there was one group in, in Samaria that was launching terrorist attacks and then selling the credit to any organization that wanted to pay for it. <laughs> okay. Today, we see the exact opposite. In other words, Hamas in Gaza says, no, it's not us, it's it's Jihad. Hezbollah says, no, it's not us. We're not sure who did it, but it, but it, it wasn't us. Don't, don't hit me, please. And I think that's a credit to Israeli deterrence capability. Yeah. Um, look, we, we thank you for this excellent briefing to introduce us to the whole topic. I think you're right that uh, the answer to the question, just how hot is Israel's northern border, the answer has to be viewed within the context of the this wider shadow war between Israel and Iran, which the northern yes. border is just one element of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, some Pakistanis just got arrested in um, somewhere in the east, in India or somewhere. Uh, they were going to attack an Israel embassy that every day something happens to thwart Iranian plotting to harm Israeli interests abroad. And yes, I don't want to say there, it, there was the recent plot in Cyprus as well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's over and over again. And even in uh even in Europe, some uh in the UK or somewhere plotted attempts where where these European countries started backing out of the US efforts to renew some sort of halfway deal with Iran over its nuclear program because yes. of the the terror and assassination plots on their soil. And so you've got this shadow war, but there has been something of a change in recent um, in recent months that that I see, you know, before you had the terror tunnels being done, dug covertly, and they were found by the IDF and have been uh, neutralized. Uh, you had the infiltrator who came across the border. Uh, how long ago was that? He he had uh, improvised explosive device and made it all the way to right, a, a few months ago. Road. Yes, to Megiddo, right? And made it all the way there. Was going to put it along the highway, blow some vehicles up or something. But that was a bad infiltration incident for Israel. Yes. But it was secret, covert. What's happening now is out in the open, public. 
but it's really kind of weak. It's kind of uh, a game. It is a kind of a game. We also have to keep in mind that Hezbollah has its own, um, how can I put it? It's, it's its own domestic audience, um, its constituents, that it needs to show that it's still relevant, it's still in the game, still in the war against Israel. Uh, remember, it, it, it's... Um, its motto, its, 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 its trademark is war with Israel. So if it's perceived as not doing much, it can actually lose its own market share of constituents who can go to another organization. Yeah, yeah. and it's been wa wasting a lot of lives over in the Syrian civil war. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanna share uh, my screen for just a minute. And right. uh, I, I think it will help benefit the people to know a little more about just what we're talking about here. This is a Google map of, uh, of uh, Israel. You see Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. And as you uh, close in on the northern border of Israel, uh, this line here is what we now refer to as the blue line, the UN blue helmeted soldiers are uh, patrolling this in Lebanon. And David, I think, it, I, I think if I can interrupt for a moment, I think it's also important to note that when we use the term border here, we're actually not using the correct term mm. because a border is an agreed upon line between two countries and Lebanon does not recognize Israel's existence, nor does Syria. Therefore, so it's the armistice line. Exactly. Technically speaking, uh, these are not borders. The yeah. blue line is, is called that because it was actually marked by the UN at our request. Yes, yes. And and they put blue barrels along exactly. it, so you know exactly where it is. The problem is that Israel came and has built a security fence a couple meters onto its side of the blue line. Correct. This leaves a little territory for Hezbollah to play games in. Where where were these two tents? I think they were up in this area near Misgalom um, or Menorah. No, no, they were no, they were further further north. They were they were closer to uh, Shaba Farms, okay, which is still that's... still to the east of here. Um, more a little further east of where you're, yeah, there. that that area. Okay, no, so it's up here. Yeah. Yeah, a little further, further to the left of that, but there's Sheba. It, this is an that's area. That's the town, but the, the farms themselves are uh, right to uh, near Gajar. Yeah, 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 around there, Rajar. Yes. Gajar, yeah. Okay, just so everyone knows, there's a dispute. It's actually uh, it was Lebanese territory up here. The line between Lebanon and Syria. Um, uh, used to run in a certain area, and Syria came and claimed some of Lebanon's territory. And then when Israel went and captured the Golan Heights in 67, some of this former Lebanese territory, then in, uh, territory, then in Syrian hands, has fallen into Israeli hands, and Hezbollah uses that as a pretext to keep the conflict alive, to have a reason for keeping the conflict going with Israel. It's just oh. a little only, only for Western consumption. Yeah. But let, let's be clear. By the way, there are a few spots along the, the border further west that they also dispute. But, yeah. but let's be very clear on this. To themselves, in their literature, in their background literature, in the Iranian literature, the objective of Hezbollah is to wipe out Israel. Hmm. Let, Lord, you know what? Let, let's, let's be clear. The objective of Hezbollah is to kill off the Jews. Yes. And that is, that's the Iranian objective as well. Uh, in, in Khomeini's most important work uh, called Islamic, Islamic Government, paragraph two, page one, starts with the words, the Jews have always been the enemies of Islam. Mm -hmm. That's, remember, that's a book on Islamic government. What do, the, what do the Jews have to do with that? Well, you can figure it out for yourself. Now, saying we want to wipe out the Jews doesn't really play well on CNN. Hmm. or in the New York Times. But saying, hey, we've got a border dispute and this war is over five meters here and eight meters there and 12 meters somewhere else, Western journalists aren't on, on the ball enough or care enough to say, really, you've been at war for 30 years over a grand total of maybe 200 feet of territory? Hmm. And they say, oh no, there's a border dispute. That makes it all legitimate. <laughs> so 
that's for Western consumption, uh, Western journalists and politicians who don't ask the critical questions because for whatever reason, they don't want to. Uh, but it's that's not their reason. And they make very clear what their reason is. They are they, Nazi-style they, anti-Semites. They, uh, they put the, the Dome of the Rock on some of their posters and flags and stuff. It's not uh, the nice, crisp apples from Sheba Farms here, what oh, really? calls Mount Dove. It's they That's want right. Jerusalem. They want the Jews out of Jerusalem. That's that was the theology of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, a few years ago, yeah. said that we are actually in favor of all the Jews moving to Israel because it'll make it easier to kill them all. Yeah. We won't have to chase them down around the world. Yeah, Israel's a one bomb country. Yeah, right. So that's yeah. that's what they have in mind. That's right. Okay, so uh, the UN marked the blue line, the armistice line, what we consider yes. the border. They actually went and 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 uh, surveyed and laid out yes. the pre-67 border, or the 48 border, pre-48. And, uh, and Israel built security fences on its side of the border, a few meters in. Correct. Hezbollah Correct. comes and, and puts two tents up in this area. And they yes. finally, Israel said, remove them, and they removed one. There's still one there. It's not such a big yes. deal, but it's right against, it's on Israeli territory against the fence. Yes. Um, now they've had some guys, were they in uniform? Were they out of uniform marching right along the border? In uniform. In uniform. Uh, and, Armed. Some, along this border. Yes. Armed. Uh, and keeping Armed. in mind that. According to UN resolutions, Hezbollah is not permitted to carry arms in South Lebanon, and yeah. UNIFIL, the United Nations forces there, are meant to disarm them. <laughs> okay, I can tell another joke if you want. <laughs> uh. And then we had, uh, they took a ladder and climbed some sort of tower, surveillance tower, and took yes. down some Israeli equipment. Right. Um, some cameras that up up, yeah. up on the border fence. And here again, it's it's all basic provocation, and we are we're essentially making the same mistake that we made in the period between two thousand and two thousand and five six, mm -hmm. and that is if we don't respond, maybe it won't escalate. Mm -hmm. uh, in in that period, it was for a different reason. Today, I think. It has to do with the government being busy dealing with other things and not wanting to escalate. And, and quite frankly, I'm, I understand them. You don't want to escalate. Israel doesn't want a war. We, we, we would like very much not to have a war. Uh, unfortunately, the proper response strategically is often paradoxical to what you want. In other words, uh, backing down very often is the surest way to gain an escalation. Mm -hmm. And standing up is very often the surest way to get a de-escalation. Mm. But mm. it's very tempting. And I, here, I understand why the government is making its decisions. I don't agree with it. I think it's a mistake. But thinking that, well, you know what, maybe if we let them get away with it this time, they won't try it again. And there was also an artillery or tank shell fired into yes. an open area, probably. I yeah. think near, 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 near Rajar, yes. And but did Israel respond? Uh, we responded by backing down. Yeah, we fired so, we fired some shells back, but we didn't didn't mean to hit anything. So you've had about a month here of sort of open provocations, games right yes. along the border, and Correct. Israel's been given a, a weak response. You're saying because of the the internal debate, this heated debate over the judicial reforms, the ruling coalition has wanted, they don't want to stir this pot on the northern border right now. I would say that that's part of it. I don't think that's the only reason. Yeah. I think that uh, look, the fact that, that we've got security issues going on now in, in Judea and Samaria means that a lot of military attention is, is being focused there. Uh, we'd rather not fight a, a multi-front war. So I think I think that that the decisions, as I said before, I understand them. They're being made with a a certain rationality that makes sense in its own sort of context, but it doesn't make sense in a strategic context because it's only going to lead to to more trouble down the road. Okay. Uh, before I take this map down, I just want to point out a couple things here. 
Uh, first of all, the northernmost town here, Matula, uh, it's basically, I mean, it's a civilian town, but it's uh, everyone has to live in the bunkers <laughs> at, at times. Uh, and the tunnels, there were six, I think, six terror tunnels that uh, Hezbollah saw what Hamas was doing in Gaza. They got some better tunneling equipment because this is rock and it's not sandy soil. And mm -hmm. two of the tunnels, one of them was over here on this side of Matula. Another was over on this side of Matula. And the plan was to send troops in on both sides and cut off Matula, isolate it. Yes. And to take the whole community hostage. I don't know, a thousand, two thousand people. Yes. Um, look here, just looking at the map, you don't need to be you know, Napoleon or General Patton to figure it out. Matula is surrounded on three sides by Lebanon. There's a very, very narrow gap uh, below it where, you, where you're showing the pointer now. You swing it straight right, exactly. Um, cutting Matula off is one of these, anybody who knows how to read terrain and knows a little bit of tactics says, you know, this is a, we know that they know that we know that they know that we know that they know that this is a, a, a vulnerable location. Yeah. Okay. If, that were, if that were a military line, as opposed to a civilian town with a, a border, a, a smart military leader would, would withdraw from there. In mm. other words, if that if that were a battlefield line alone, but it's our border, it's our territory. We're not withdrawing, and that means it's vulnerable. And 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 the army is relating to that. In other well, words, they're a hardy hardy group. Those those are hardy souls who live in Matula and all, yes. all along this border. Um, now, the guy who infiltrated, and uh, we just want people to know, he got in somewhere. We don't know exactly where he came over yeah. yet. How did he get over? Is that ever but, figured but, out? Yeah, but probably somewhere in the west. In other words, some, somewhere in the area where you oh, can see Shlum, Shlummy, Shlum, okay. like that area. All right. And they made it with a, a, an improvised explosive device all the way down uh, here to, there. Yes. Near, to, to Megiddo. There's a prison here at this intersection and the Megiddo uh, biblical site, the Tel Megiddo, where we get the phrase Armageddon. But he was going to try and blow up traffic right, right here. Well, he actually, he left a bomb. It went off. He left, it went off, but no one was was hurt. Uh, no, one, one, one civilian was hurt. Um, an Israeli Arab from one of the villages in that area was injured. That was a serious uh, infiltration incident. That uh, he also he almost made it back. He got as far as Naharia. Ah, uh, my! All the way up here along the coast. Yes. Okay, yep. he made a swim swim over or something. They, they've even used the PLO used hang gliders to get across back. They in the did. They 80s. did. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, you mentioned the town of Shlomi right here. Yes. Uh, you can see it's just uh, the edge of it. I was talking to the general manager of the city, the CEO yesterday. Okay. He says they're about a, a hundred meters from the border on the right. upper edge of their community. Uh, right. They have nine or 10,000 people. Uh, and the, uh, they were hit by one of the rockets fired from Tyre. Uh, yes. Up here, up, up uh, coast, yes. ancient city of Tyre, where a lot of Palestinians used to be Fatah land, but for Hamas yes. to fire rockets from there means Hamas is taking over from Fatah in the area, and yes. uh, and Shlomi uh, needs bomb shelters, and we just we 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 placed three of them recently uh, at a synagogue and two at a playground. We got three more to go in. Uh, we may bring our friend uh, Rabbi Shmuel Bowman. He's with us on the webinar. We'll bring him in in a minute. But we're going to we've signed an agreement to uh, refurbish 53 bomb shelters in Shlomi because uh, they they, have, they uh, need them. They need them, and the reason is uh, let me see if I can pull that up uh, because of this. This was the rocket that hit right in Shlomi near the bank, near the synagogue. People were praying there about an hour or two earlier on Passover. This was Passover, uh, the, the first day of Passover, and they get hit by a, a rocket uh, from Lebanon. So we're, we're going in and helping them with shelters. We'll talk a little more about that towards the end of our webinar. I, I just, uh, I think really 
the, what we need to deal with right now, uh, Elliot, the, the calculations, it, it, you know, I think we're in a situation where any sort of accident, miscalculation, things can escalate quickly. Yes. Both sides, like in 2006, when he, when Nasrallah, uh, they, they hit a IDF patrol along the border. They wanted a couple bodies to uh, either dead or alive. Well, they wanted them alive if they could have gotten them. Yes, because they'd get more in a prisoner exchange. And, yes, and uh, Nasrallah did not expect such a huge Israeli response, and we round right. up with a 34, 35 day rocket war, Israel's longest yes. conflict, and really yes. horrible for the North. We're in a situation where a miscalculation, a misstep, an accident, these provocations, Israel's trying to hold back. Do you think Israel is really planning war right now? Uh, Especially okay. if they are, it's against Iran. And I'm, my question is, let me uh, put it in this context. We, we had two large IDF exercises. One was sort of nationwide, and then one centered on the north, north. thousands of troops. Yes. It's done in open public. If you're planning to attack Iran, you don't announce it and tell everyone you're holding an exercise. You're just sending a bit. But it was a big signal. And there were people who have a big following out there among pro-Israel Christians, uh, one in particular, I won't name them, saying we are on the edge of war and really just stirring um, and, and saying, I have intelligence sources that say this or this or this. Okay. And I tell you, if, if you, I, maybe it's different for you, but if I or this source had real intelligence about Israel plotting to attack Iran, we're all in trouble because it's yes. leaked out. We're all in trouble because it's leaked out. Right. And these things like the Kaibar, uh, when Olmert ordered the Kaibar, the strike on the Syrian nuclear reactor, yes. it was a quiet morning. You had no idea. And all of a sudden, Correct. the word comes, Boom. they struck. It just hits yes. you when you least expect it. And if it was real intelligence, the, this guy says, I have sources, intelligence sources, military telling me this and that, we're going to war, we're going to war. If they were giving real intelligence out that way so loosely, the IDF military censor would have shut them down long ago. Am they I would have ended up in prison. Um, but let Thank me... You. Let me clarify now. I, I don't know who said what to whom. Yeah. I do not give out classified information. Uh, so let, let me sort of clarify what is clearly true and publicly clearly true and what is certainly not public uh, in terms of I won't tell you what it is, but I'll, but I'll tell you, I'll categorize it for you. There's, it's not a secret that we are planning a strike against Iran. We have stated publicly, we will not tolerate in Iran with nuclear weapons. That's not a secret. That's been said publicly by prime ministers, defense ministers, chiefs of staff, to anybody who's willing to listen. That type of a strike will clearly be heavily waited on the Air Force. The Air Force has publicly stated that they're practicing for it. So once again, this is no secret. We have said, as I said earlier, the next war with Hezbollah is going to be the, their last war. And once again, no secret, you do not eliminate an organization like that from the air. You do it from the ground. If they engage us in a war, or if a war escalates from something that they do, we are going into Lebanon on the ground and in force. Once again, not a secret. We're practicing it openly. Now, on the one hand, you could say these are all warnings to them. Don't start. On the other hand, there are times when you say, you know what? I, I've got to practice something so big that there's no point in, in messing around about it. Let's, let's, let's be honest, because everybody can, 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 can deduce the right answer without much effort. Now, having said that, when will these things happen? I have no idea. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. 
Yes. It's my belief that nobody has the precise answer to that question. When I say nobody, I mean, including the general staff and the, the civilian leadership in this country. I can tell you categorically when it's going to happen. We're going to strike Iran at the last possible moment, just as we struck the Iraqi reactor in 81 at the last possible moment. The Syrian reactor was something else, but it was the most opportune moment. When we, when we come to Iran, most opportune means the last moment possible. When will that be? When the intelligence boys and girls come and say, we're at the last possible moment. Mm -hmm. And I should add to that, that we're doing everything we possibly can to push that moment as far down the road as we possibly can. With all sorts of operations, again, some of them are clearly public, like the cyber operations, there's sabotage, taking out Iranian uh, science, scientists who are involved and military leaders who are involved in, in, in this, setting them back. We're not stopping them. We are not driving them in reverse, but we are slowing down their progress. So will it be next month or next year or in two years? It's when all of the cards that we have have been played and the only hand left to deal is an actual strike. Hmm. I think it will help if uh, this iron beam gets uh, put in place, these lasers that can more e efficiently, uh, cost efficient, uh, taking out uh, some of the new rock, not only rockets and missiles, but the, drones. As you, drones. As, yes. as you watch Here, the, the conflict in Ukraine and the widening use of drones with lethal effect there. Yes. Iran knows how to do coordinated missile and drone attacks. They yes. it in, down in Saudi Arabia oil fields. But we, we've also already shown that we have ways of dealing with them electronically. Exactly. Here, David, I want to say something. I, I, people who know me know that I am devoutly low tech. So I'm saying this in, 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 in that context. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in technological solutions. I think you should use technology. I think technology has a value. I'm not, I don't, I don't mean, you know, Go go back to you know, to living in a cave, but a reliance on technology, particularly in the military, but not just reliance on technology, will ultimately lead to failure. Hmm. Now we have a very strange kind of human egotism, but you know now we're in a uniquely new technological era. Well, you know what? Human beings have been saying that since Adam. Mm -hmm. Every generation has its own technology. We have fire, we have the wheel, we have all sorts of things that, that are gonna make us unstoppable. I will argue that not only does technology not solve it, but as technology becomes more and more advanced and particularly military, but not, not only military technology, the shorter its shelf life, okay? Mm -hmm. Three or four years ago, drones were going to be the be all end all answer to warfare. Now they don't work anymore. Hmm. Okay, and, and just as a, as, as a point of that, I remember, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember that when I was growing up, we had a box on the wall that was called a telephone. Mm -hmm. And that telephone was there for years and years and years and years and years. Same telephone, you picked it up, you dialed a number, and it worked mm -hmm. for years. Today, we have these things that after, what, two years, yes. we have to get new ones? Yes. <laughs> okay. So more advanced for sure, but their obsolescence and, 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 and sort of being overtaken by the next generation gets shorter and shorter and shorter as time goes on. So I would say all of the new anti-missile technologies have a value, anti-rocket technologies, until the other side comes up with something new. Yeah. Well, it is, it is good that uh, you know, it's better if you're... you're uh techie nerds are better than their techie nerds and you're sure. better than theirs, but uh, you're right. Uh, I mean, the trench warfare we're seeing in Ukraine is from a hundred years ago. Or more. Exactly. Really, exactly. Even with, with all, the drones. With, right. With all due respect to the drones and the rockets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But I really, I think it's important for all our listeners and you can spread the word, tell everyone if you've got someone 
uh, coming to you from Israel. I have the latest. You're not getting this anywhere else. My intelligence sources say we're going to do this, and this is happening. I'm telling you, taking these the, these war exercises that the IDF announced, and everyone in Israel knew about them. He's going on and saying, no one knows about this. You're only hearing this here. Israel is preparing for war. And I just think it's so irresponsible to get people worked up and if you, you cry wolf enough times, and maybe maybe that following will start dropping. But they they've got uh, hundreds of thousands of followers, and it's it's very irresponsible. If they had real intelligence sources giving out real intelligence from real sources, the IDF sensor would have shut them down years ago, and you said they'd be in jail. I think everyone yes. needs to know that it's irresponsible to make those sort of claims and to be so loose about it, especially if you claim to be a follower of the Lord. Okay, uh, we've got a couple questions here uh, in okay. the Q&A. Uh, why didn't Israel arrest the Hezbollah infiltrator? I believe they called him. You said they called him up near... We did, we Mahomet. did, we didn't, we did arrest him. We and, did. We uh, uh, the, another question, it's related to Gaza. There's uh, anti-Hamas demonstrations there, not reported in the Western media. Is there such a movement in Lebanon against Hezbollah or too dangerous for Lebanese? Look, uh, there have been uh, periods of mass demonstrations in Lebanon mm -hmm. where the Sunni, Mosul uh, Sunni Muslims and the Christian Arabs there in Lebanon don't like Hezbollah taking control of the country. They've bankrupted the country. There have been recent protests. Uh, and they haven't been too disturbed this time. They've been allowed to protest, but there's not much they can do about it. Hezbollah has a firm grip on the country. Also, uh, it's important, I think, to note that not all the Shiites in Lebanon support Hezbollah. Yeah. There, there's, there's a split among the Shiites. The majority do support them, but there's a, a minority that's not insignificant that supports an organization called Amal, Amal. which is not allied with Hezbollah. So Le Lebanon is a fragmented country. Most people basically want to hunker down and be and and sort of protect their own interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, only when it gets really out of hand are you going to see mass demonstrations against someone like Hezbollah. Um, and I know I think uh, you've been on as a guest a couple of times. I always sort of uh, have to come to this question too. Do you think Hezbollah's military strength has been eroded some? with this diversion into the Syrian civil war. I mean, some say, well, now they're battle, battle hard and they got experience. But yes. some of the Shiites who don't support them may be because they sent their sons off to war and they came back in coffins. So, okay, here, here again, I think the net has been to their advantage. They are a much more combat experienced. I don't like the word battle hardened because that, that, that's, uh, that implies that the more, more combat you're in, the better you get. Uh, the more combat you're in, the more PTSD you have. Yeah. Uh, but the organization has learned to do things that it didn't know how to do before. So when it recruits new people, it can train them at an entirely different level. Mm -hmm. I would not put too much weight into the Shiite criticism because once again, Amal, which is the, the Shiite organization that is most critical of Hezbollah, is the one that came out and said, you know, Hezbollah shouldn't be involved in Syria. We're we're a Lebanese organization. Amal, by the way, has always been a very uh, Lebanese-oriented organization, not aligned with Syria, not aligned with Iran particularly. Uh, so that's where the, the competition comes in. I am not aware of many Hezbollah supporters who opposed Hezbollah on, on its Syrian adventure. Okay. All right. Um, I want to ask uh, um, uh, Calera, who is our technical expert here, if uh, we have Shmuel Bowman. He's with Operation Life Shield for, uh, I guess it's around 15 years now. We've been putting in portable bomb shelters with Shmuel. I don't know how we get him on the screen now, uh, but he's he's on, on the, um, there he comes. Shmuel. Hey, Elliot, do you know Shmuel Bowman? He lives no, in a vaguely. We've been friends for what, close to 30 years now? 
Okay. Uh, Shmuel, your camera on, your video on. Are you with us? I know he was on there. Maybe he stepped away for a minute. Here he comes. There you go. In his car. How how are you? Yeah, have you're to mute, you're your muted. Sound. You're muted. There you there go. go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Let me just pull over right here because we do things safely. <clears throat> <laughs> oh hi, hi there. Hi, 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 David. Hi, Elliot. Uh, hi. Good How are you? Shmuel, David okay, wants to know if, if if I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just turn. If I turn my camera sideways, is that better? That's better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we 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 know each other. We know we each did. other a long time. We've had we admit knowing each other. We've we've had uh, many uh, many adventures. <laughs> okay. I, but I want to I just say that that uh, how fortunate uh, any everybody who is uh, listening and participating in this uh, webinar is, and I'm not just saying this uh, in, just because Elliot's a friend, but I I say this because I just got back from. Uh, North America, I was in the United States and Canada, having discussions with a whole array of people, uh, people who, and these are people who, who are into Israel. These are people who, who are like connecting with Israel, <laughs> and they're not getting the information. How much more so the vast, the vast public of uh, uh, the vast, the vast leader, uh, um, readership and viewers of and consumers of of uh, information in the United States and Canada and perhaps Europe who are simply not getting any of this and so I really think that what Elliot's providing is uh, extremely important the, the next question is going to be is what do, what do we do with it how do we mobilize around it so um, yeah yeah okay we just wanted to bring you on we're working with uh, Shmuel right now we've done 200 almost 200 portable bomb shelters uh through operation life shield which uh Shmuel bowman is the executive director of that and we're putting six shelters i think you got nine in total going into shlomi these portable bomb shelters we're doing six plus we're gonna you helped us work out a contract to refurbish 53 underground shelters in the town of shlomi right so if we just dial about you you guys have been talking about the attack that took place um Passover. in shlomi on passover mm -hmm. um and that would have been when would that that have been in april no was that april, april. yeah that was april 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 yeah and um <clears throat> and just to give you some background how how we heard about it this is that the mayor uh gabi neeman uh, it, it was on TV, it was on television, I think the day after, the next day. And he was talking about how um, this happened and how they're in a very vulnerable position, don't have enough bomb shelters in the public areas. And, uh, and we responded right away. Uh, and, um, and thanks to the ICEJ, uh, we were able to get in there so fast, uh, it, it, they're, 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 head, they're spinning, they're just spinning. They couldn't believe it, such gratitude. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, we're now putting in numerous number of uh, shelters in public areas, playgrounds, and, and so on and so forth. As you talked about, schools, kindergartens, the synagogue, and then the 53 bomb shelters. These are bomb shelters in uh, in buildings where people who are living in socioeconomic um, difficulty are living there. They can't afford to repair their own bomb shelters. We're talking about shelters that have don't have any lighting that don't have proper uh, sewage uh, that need to be repainted and uh, thanks to the icj um u.s branch uh those 53 bomb shelters are going to all be refurbished and brought up to speed so that people will be able to use them safely and comfortably very good okay i'm just very, uh, very important i'm putting uh, a mess uh, in the chat room Whoop, I got I to spell it right. Uh, I left off the right word. If you want to donate towards bomb shelters in, uh, in the town of Shlomi, all along the northern border, they need it. Uh, they need more shelters. It's been ignored. All the resources have gone into the southern area. We've done about 150 shelters there uh, with, uh, Shlo with uh, Shmuel Bowman and Operation Life Shield, but we're doing, we've done around 50 in the north, plus 
these underground shelters. There's a real need. You go, you go to give.icej.org slash crisis, C-R-I-S-I-S, give.icej.org slash crisis and make a donation for bomb shelters there. And thank you for considering that. Shmuel, thank you for uh, popping in on us. We're good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you, guys. Good. And Elliot, we just thank you for your time and your expertise, your analysis. Uh, I think it, it really helps. Uh, we're in this period where Hezbollah's doing provocations. They're in the open. Uh, they know Israel may be holding back some right now. They don't want the headache of a conflict right now amid these debate, but they don't need to, they better not miscalculate because Israel's strong and already has plans for how they would react if they really want to escalate to a full yes. conflict. And the, and the IDF is strong. There's a problem with the reservists and it's a lot of intelligence officers, a lot of Air Force pilots, but if the nation's at war, they're going to show up. They're going to show up. I, I believe so, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll call on you again. We hope it oh, stays. It's a pleasure. Uh, things cool off, but uh, we know when we call on you, there's a reason for it, and you've uh, been very faithful in, in coming and joining us on these webinars. All the best to you, and we'll talk to you, you later, uh, some follow-up. But we thank you for joining us for this uh, ICEJ webinar. I uh, just want to remind you, next Wednesday, 4 p.m., our global prayer gathering. Uh, join us uh, then for uh, to pray with uh, Christian leaders from around the world. We'll have worship as well. Uh, our weekly uh, global prayer gathering on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Israel time. We'll have another webinar in a month's time, the first Thursday of September. If the need arises, we may have uh, uh, some developments come about. We may have one earlier. We will probably do also a feast webinar somewhere in there, but just stay alert. Make sure you signed up for our uh, weekly emails. We send out two emails a week to our ministry updates that you can know when we're back on with our next webinar and the topic and the guests. And last but not least, we want to encourage you, make plans now to join us for the Feast of Tabernacles 2023 here in Jerusalem. If you can come in person, there's still time to do it. Otherwise, join us for the virtual feast online. If you go to feast.icej.org, you can find all the different packages, uh, in-person attendance or online attendance. Is, it's all available there. There's several of each to choose from at feast.icej.org. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you from Jerusalem.